and it's all the men of faith that we get to look through in the scriptures who turned to God and put their faith and trust in him. In times where there were great victories and in time when there was great adversity, no matter what came up in their lives, their trust was in God, their faith was in God. That his ways were right and in the end, things would be good for them if they continued to put their trust in him. So, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. I think we can understand that, right? And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes. It's an interesting term, isn't it? On Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, and I think this verse is more than, I, I, I know this verse is more than like, how do I cope with daily life challenges? We can be tempted to think that this is just about so that I, you know, do a good job and I don't yell back when somebody yells back at me and, you know, I'm a good worker and I'm a good this and I'm a good that. I mean, this is fixing our eyes on Jesus so that we gr don't grow weary and faint in living a life for God and for Christ. That's really what it is. We can be tempted to focus on the temporal and lose sight of the eternal. We can be tempted to focus on the things that are gonna fade away at the expense of the things that are gonna stand. Really, that's what the Christian faith is about. And you know, as we're sharing the news about a brother who's falling asleep in Christ, I mean, anybody here who's ever lost a loved one can tell you during that time, the temporal Foolish things don't seem to matter to you a whole lot, do they? You know, sometimes, and sometimes, you know, while it's sad, we don't sorrow as those who don't have hope, and it's a good reminder to us that in those times, it's clear to us what really matters, isn't it? Not one of us is gonna lay on our deathbed and say to ourselves, I wish I made more money, I wish I built bigger bonds, I wish I attained more. You probably, if you're a Christian, you're going to wish you gave more to the purpose of living for God and for Christ in this world, aren't you? You're going to wish that you loved the people around you better. You're going to wish you shared the gospel with those that were perishing. You're not going to wish you would, you know, work more, build more, gain more. That's only going to perish anyway, right? And, those are, and that's a sober thinking, but it's the healthy way of thinking. It's a fixed way of thinking that we must have. And, what I look, want to look at with you this morning is, as we're looking at Jesus, we're looking at the Son of God who's fixed and focused. He's deliberate in what he's doing. He has a purpose, he understands what his purpose is. And we're not just looking, and we're gonna look in, the, in a few minutes, we're gonna look in the Gospel of John at, at the statements where Jesus says, I am blank, a lot of metaphors. But Jesus is not a metaphor. And he's not somebody you're gonna know just simply by reading a book. And that's why I want to start in this verse here. And while the, the scriptures give us the understanding of who Christ is and to grow in that relationship and to, get to know God, I'm reminded that we serve a living God and a risen Savior. And it's not just some, and God is not somebody I just understand through a corporate worship session. And Jesus isn't, you know, somebody that I understand just from studying and being in, in this. He's my Savior. He's the one who, when I am tempted to sin, who comes to my aid and strengthens me, personally and really. Now, in Acts 25, Paul, as his manner is, didn't know political correctness and got himself in trouble with the religious Jewish leaders. They weren't too happy about him speaking to them about this Jesus of Nazareth, and um, he got himself in trouble. So now, the Jews end up getting him arrested, and he's being passed from place to place. And at this point, he is, uh, he's leaving uh, this man Festus, and he's being sent to a King Agrippa. And then, let's see, verse 14. While they were spending many days there, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, there is a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. Now this is actually interesting because this, what we're reading, is an outside witness to Paul and what was going on in his life. Meaning, this is like reading the Providence Journal report, if you will, 
about what happened. It's not a biased Christian witness. It's simply a witness about what Paul was about. All right, let's see. So and when I was a Jew, verse 15, the chief reason elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answer them that it is not the custom of the Romans to hand over any man before the accused meets his accusers face to face and has an opportunity to make his defense against the charges. So after they had assembled there, I did not delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought before me. When the accusers stood up, they began bringing charges against him, not of such crimes as I was expecting, but they simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to what? Be alive. Isn't that a telling statement in a simple little verse? That the assertment of Paul from this third party witnesses, this is just, and he, he knows nothing about the, really, very little about the God of Israel, very little about faith, and very little about what's at stake here. So his testimony is, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, he, he did some great, horrible crime, and I gotta bring, no, it's, it's, it's disagreements. Religious disagreements between Paul's and the Jews over Jesus, who this guy says who's a dead man, but Paul says he's alive. And interesting, Paul's conversion experience, while unique to him, certainly is the pattern I believe that the scriptures want to know that it is, it is when the resurrected Lord comes to us to reveal his Father to save us that our lives get, we have a choice to make to respond. Respond to the grace of God and the mercy that God has shown us. That we serve a living Savior who promised that his church, he would be with us always into the end of the age as we go out and do the things that he's commissioned to us to do. That when two or more are gathered together in his name, we are, he is there in the midst. Now either he lied or he told the truth. And we can't just relegate that to the, to the area of being a metaphor or wishful thinking, but it actually is the reality for the Christian church. What mocks us out as the people of God is that God is with us, and what mocks us out as the new covenant people of God, that God is with us through his son. That's the beauty of the new covenant. And to try to live a Christian life without the son of God is impossible. For me to try to do it on wishful thinking, strength, and reading my Bible alone, then there, it gets disappointing. But to sustain it and to have the power and the joy to go places we wouldn't want to go. See, if we, leave, if we live a safe life with some good morals, some good ways of dealing with people, trying not to beat up each other too much, trying not to lie too much, we never know the power of the Christian life. But if we follow the commissioning of the church and what it means to be a Christian in a dark world, then we need him totally. It's imp if you've tried to do it, you understand the impossibility to do it in your own strength. That's why we need him. That's why we look to him and all we do. Turn to John with me, chapter 6. As we're looking to Jesus and as we're, and as we're looking in the scriptures to see the things he says, know, know that we're not alone. No, we're not reading a story about somebody like George Washington. But we're growing in knowledge and relationship with the one who's there with us. Something that nobody could take away from Paul, by the way. You know what I'm saying? Nobody could take that away from Paul. Paul's a great one to look at. You could not take away from Paul. You couldn't stone it out of him. You couldn't beat it out of him. You couldn't shipwreck it out of him. You couldn't desert it out of him. Everybody on the planet could have forsaken him, and he was fixed, because nobody was going to tell him his Lord was not alive and hadn't saved him from the wrath to come, and hadn't given him a life worth living, no matter what joys it brought or what, what cost it brought it didn't matter to him because knowing Christ Jesus his Lord was everything to him everything he was fixed on that purpose that was his fixed purpose now interestingly in John 6 we're going to look at you know what time doesn't allow us and it would be wonderful to take time to look at these on your own but Jesus makes these I am the light of the world I am the bread of life I am the res we're going to look at some of them this morning Here's where he speaks about being the bread of life. Contextually, what's happened is he has fed a multitude miraculously. God has provided for their food needs, and Jesus provides a miracle, and there you go. About 5,000 people get fed. Jesus goes up on a mountaintop alone, it says. What does he usually do on the mountaintop alone? He prays. 
and the disciples take a boat and they go to the other side. Well, the people decide they want to find this guy Jesus again, and let's see what it says here. So, verse 24, so when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Well, now it says they what? They got in small boats, so they exerted an effort, didn't they? And they're seeking who? Jesus. Okay. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. Now interestingly, did Jesus feed them? Yes. Was it wrong for Jesus to feed them? No. no. But it's interesting, they were putting a lot of effort and energy to seek him, not for the true things that he was going to give them, but for the temporal things. They had missed the whole point of Jesus in themselves. They wanted the temporal things. They wanted their own personal needs, and they were missing the very food that Jesus was giving them to have. Amen. The very food. That's a lesson for us, because many times, does God take care of our needs? Yes. When we come to the Lord, do we get our hearts healed? Do we get things taken care of for us? Sure we do. But I think for the Christian, we need to graduate from, you know, I need my needs met. You know, I, I need to be a follower of Christ. I need to, I need to, and what is it here? Let's keep reading. This is great record. So let's, verse 20. Therefore they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Great question. Anybody want to work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Well, that sums up the work of God in one thing. Now that may sound way too simplistic for some of you. You may be wanting lightning bolts and, you know, the five-point plan and, 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 you know, and, and, but this is the work of God, some, some, the one statement, to believe on him, believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? I guess multiplying loaves and fishes wasn't sign enough for these guys. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? You know, and some, how many of you have testimonies of great things that only God can do for you? And then, next morning, you're like, why is my head stupid again? <laughs> why is, you know, it's such the weakness of men. The God can do great and powerful things in our lives that only can be give the glory to him. And then two days later, or the next day, we're like, I say stupid, and you, you fill in your own blank. I'm stupid again. I'm stupid again. So let's say, verse, uh, the, what work do you perform? Verse 31, interesting. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Now, they bring up this record to Jesus. Now, let's think about what's going on at stake in the wilderness at the time. The children of Israel were in the wilderness. It wasn't loaded with crops and fields and loaded with stuff. It's pretty much a desert place. There's not much to pick at there. So what were they? They were hungry, right? And they were hungry for something to eat, not only to satisfy their hunger, but because they needed their lives to be sustained, right? That's really what it is. We're hungry and we're gonna perish if we don't get something to eat. Fair enough, if you're in a desert place, it's a little bit more than, gee, I've been working all day and I wonder what my wife's got for dinner because I'm hungry. It's in a whole different category of hunger. So the issue here is hunger and life being sustained, right? That's what bread is gonna represent to the children of Israel in the wilderness. So let's see what Jesus says. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives what? Life to the world. They said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not, what? Hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. Well, what does that say? That in Jesus, our greatest longings, hungers, and thirsts will be satisfied. Now and forever. That's what God makes available to us through his son. Now and forever. 
The question is, do I have the wilderness hunger and thirst? Do I recognize that my life is sustained in God through his son? Do I recognize that? If I try to live the life that God calls me to live, I can't do it without him. It's at, it, that's what he, he's getting at. And it's about eternal life, by the way. You know, they're talking about, oh, give us more food. You know, you know give us more food. We want more food. We want, want more of our needs met now. And he took care of their needs, didn't he? He didn't diminish that. But he, he reminded them not to lose their focus over the food that really matters and the things that really matter in life. We need to remember this, because sometimes life doesn't go the way we wish it would go. But we even, I heard this morning, it's not my way, it's his way. God doesn't owe me anything. He sent his son to die for me. I owe him everything. I owe his son everything for what he went through for me. Not only is it right, but it's reasonable. Not only is it right and reasonable, it is the only true response if we accurately assess what was done for us and what was at stake. And that's sometimes more sober than we care to think about, but it's true. It's true, there's so much at stake eternally, and then we get caught up in the temporal. You know, how, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna figure out this job today? How, you know, you fill in the blanks for your, your life. And those are important, and Jesus did things. He walked by the way, and he ate, and he drank, and he probably set up dinner times with his disciples. But as he was going along the way, he kept his focus singular on what his purpose was about. He kept his focus singular. All these parables, uh, these metaphors he's gonna use is about how his life is about reconciling men back to God and them having eternal life. That's, and somehow that's a familiar thing to us and it grows dull in our heart and our hearing. I who sin against God, I who are depraved by nature, can be reconciled to a holy God and saved from his wrath because he is love and mercy. I don't have to have the fear of death, which you know, I know as we're thinking about, you know, we don't have to have the fear of death. It's not about gaining the whole world now, it's about gaining the world to come. It's, that's what it's about. Let's look now, if you will, at um, John 11. My life will live differently. You know, great things we've been hearing. You know, we were charged recently as fathers and husbands and elders and younger to, to be people that live like the family of God, the older helping the younger, the younger showing respect and learning from each other. Ultimately, I don't do that for the benefit of that person alone. I do it for the sake of the one who died for me. Now that may not sound comfortable because every one of us wants to feel special, but you know, I love my wife ultimately for Christ's sake. Because if I love her for her sake above Christ, I can go into idolatry if I'm not careful. And will compromise what my Lord would have me to do. Because my love for him is supposed to surpass my love for any relationship, right? That's his words. Now, my wife is going to be the wonderful benefactor of me loving her the way Christ loved the church. It's not like she gets lost in the process. But I have to keep that clear. I have to keep that focus clear that I live for the one who died for me. He's the one who gives me the bread of life. He is the bread of life I need to eat and sustain. You know, that section we just looked at, and again, I'm just trying to cover a few things with you. I want you to go back and look at these things. I want you to go back. We have Bibles. We're, we're encouraged to look in the scriptures, and I encourage you to go back and look at that record in John 6 and read more of it. But they didn't get what Jesus was saying. Because he told them he had to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And they were like, what are you talking about? It went over their head. He said, the words that I speak to you are spirit and life. That's the context that that comes up in. Jesus was telling them that what he was saying to them had to be revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. They had to understand what Jesus was saying because they were spiritual truths. He's not. I mean, otherwise, he's literally crazy. He's saying, come have, you know, I'll tell them to be cannibals, which is crazy. That's not what he was saying. It's, our, it's what sustains us. It's what 
keeps us and what gives us the reason for life. It's a joyful life. It's not an easy life. It means we have to do hard things. That's honestly the struggle we get, is the hard things that we know that we are called by God and Christ to live into, we stand at the door and we don't go through it. And that we never know how much we need him to do this. You know what I'm saying? I, I mean, I just want to, and I want to express to you that last year, I just want to use one example personally to share with you. You know, last, you, you go into, I go into a village in India to preach the gospel to people that worship other gods. And you ha you're preaching this message where God has plenty of competition, and he has it here too. Don't forget that. God's got plenty of competition here too. But you preach about a God who sends his son, and he's the only God. You preach this message there. And then people come up and pray. You're like, I, I mean, honestly, my prayer is, God, hear the prayer and demonstrate who you are above all other gods. Otherwise, I look like a schmo, and so don't you. We got to take that risk to live the Christian life. That risk is no different no matter where I live. What are they going to think of me? I don't know what to say. Great. Now you're ready. <laughs> now you're ready. That's why we've been given the Holy Spirit. Even to teach this today, I don't know how to communicate this to you. I really don't. God's going to teach me and you today. God's going to teach us. And that's my prayer, and I hope that's your prayer every time you come to hear the words spoken to you, is that God would speak to you, not the pastor, not the teacher. God, speak to me something that will sustain my life, to help me live more for you, to bring glory to you. But if I live my life about my way, for my needs, my way, I got all my walls set up, I'll serve you God on Sunday, I'll serve you God on Wednesday, but no, 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 Friday's off limits, I got my plans. No, 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 I don't go there. No, 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 no. I have a master. I go where he, and I go where he wants me to go, and sometimes that's not comfortable, isn't it? As we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, we have to look at who he was and how he lived, and that he was singular in purpose. He was singular in purpose. And we are called what? The body of Christ, and he is the head. Do you think he has a different agenda now than he had when he walked on in, in Israel close to 2,000 years ago? No. So if we want to know what we, the church, are supposed to be about, we will see it in Jesus. And it's bigger than just how I treat my wife and my kids. That's good. I better be good to my, with father, husband, and stuff. Otherwise, you know, if I can't take care of my own stuff, my house life is a mess, what witness am I going to give? But, but it doesn't end there. And that's not the end all be all. Me as a father and a husband have to teach my wife to follow Christ and my children to follow Christ and to lose their life for his sake that they may gain life. Fathers and mothers, your children need to hear the gospel from you. Not just Noah had a nice little aki aki. They need to hear the gospel. They need to hear what their Lord did for them. They need to know that, that there are people who need them to be the light which we're not going to look at this moment, but to be the light where they are. That These children, there are places on the planet where the children are the ones that are leading the parents to the Lord. Don't let this world mold you into thinking anything's impossible with God. We think there's so many systems in place, we've been so manipulated by the news, by psychology and everything else, and thinking we can't be the people God's called us to be. It's a lie from hell. God is... God owes nothing. He, he doesn't stand back in awe of any man, any government of men, and any system of men. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And that might just mean we've got to deal with a little flack in the process. I'd rather deal with a little flack for standing up for my Lord in a dark age where people are dying around me than to just cower. I don't want to, I mean, I, I don't know raise your hands, but aren't you tired of cowering? in front of people who don't care about your eternal life or anybody else's? We gotta know this risen savior. We know him, oh man. We gotta know more than just what we read about him. We gotta know him, he's gotta be our bread. And in here, this is the John 11. It says, um, this is where, you know, Jesus had some very close friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and they were in Bethany. 
And Jesus gets word that Lazarus is sick. So instead of saying, put, you know, this is interesting, think about it. Instead of like um, ruts dropping everything and going there, he delays. And Lazarus dies. So in verse 14, I'm sorry, uh, let's see, verse 11. Then he said, and after that he said, this he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. You know, think about it. Very simple statement. If somebody's sick and they're sleeping, good for them. They'll get better. <laughs> go to the doctor. Bring plenty of fluids and get plenty of rest. <laughs> It's good advice. It's still, it's still the advice now thousands of years later. So, now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Therefore Thomas, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us go so that we may die with him. I mean, he, Jesus has not always got the most cooperative crowd of people around him. <laughs> and neither will you and I. And sometimes it might be the closest people in our life that don't get it when we want to serve the Lord. We don't have to treat them like jerks, but we have to stay fixed on what the Lord calls us to do. We don't have to be hard and, 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 and inconsiderate and unkind. We need to just be focused on who it is that we serve. Now. Verse 17, so when Jesus came, he found that he had been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. It's a pretty tough statement. I, I don't know how, how she's saying it to him exactly. You know, if you had been here, my brother, you know, I mean, I don't know. You ever have somebody say, well, if you had done this, this wouldn't have happened? That's not always, <laughs> that's not an easy statement to hear sometimes, is it? If you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. So, at any rate, but she, she recognizes what? That there's a resurrection coming in the last day, correct? Um... But Jesus' aunt said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He, believes in, he who believes in me will live, even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now that's an interesting, he's saying two things there. He's basically confirming what she says. That if you believe in me, though he dies, he's going to live. But he's also saying something else. He's saying that who believes in me will never die. And the resurrection life of Christ that we find in Christ is that we are, you know, we now know in the new covenant, we're resurrected to new creations in Christ. I now live a new life sustained by Christ. He is my resurrection now. He is my resurrection when he returns. He is my life. He's the sustainer of my life. That should thrill us. That should make a difference. That will make us light. I don't have to, we're not going there. That will make us light like him in a dark world. But if I go home today and I got my usual plan of comfort and, you know, and nothing can interrupt that, and if I got my week all planned out, and I mean, can you, think about it for a minute, can you and I think about what it must have been for Peter, James, and John to be working in the boats and Jesus comes along and says, follow me, and they leave. I mean, James and John's case, they just leave the father in the boat and they take off. Now, I am not saying that means tomorrow leave your jobs and just go off into the mystical nowhere land. What I am saying is, is that sometimes it's really never convenient to our plan sometimes to do the will of God. As a matter of fact, it's going to be contrary many, most of the time to our plans. Now, that doesn't mean I don't plan to go to work. You, you guys get the point. It's some, but will I stop? Will I have such an agenda planned for my day that I can't possibly stop to do the will of the one who died for me? It's radical, isn't it? But there are eternal verities at stake. There are eternal verities at stake in the lives of people. You know, and, and I'm, I hate it. A few months ago, I was so stinking busy that, you know, 
And here's the other thing. I hate, you know what I hate about being busy? I hate that somebody calls me and I feel I'm too busy to take the time to talk to them. Ever been there? And I legitimately are too busy. I'm a plumber. Sometimes, you know, I got, you know, people are waiting to get their house back in order and I don't have a minute to stop. Now, I'm, you know, I can't get on the phone for three hours maybe necessarily, but you get my point. I have to be willing to lay aside my plans. And if I am non-negotiable in that, then I am my Lord and he's not. If, I am non, if my life is non-negotiable to Jesus, then he can't be my Lord. Right? Because Lord means I'm the servant, he's the master. And in the next few weeks as we continue to look at his life and what he went through and what the cross means and all that he went through and the resurrection and what we've been given in God in him, we'll be like, I want to do that. I'm hungering and thirsting for him and more of him. Amen? So Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will, will live even if he dies. And everyone who dies and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she's, you know, her answer was, yeah, and that's, you know what, I'll just leave that. Do you believe this? Do I believe this? This is the question. Do I believe what he just said, that he is the resurrection and the life? We're looking to Jesus, right? That's what, you know, we're looking. Well, we'll he, it's funny because all these metaphors are very singular focused. It almost says the same thing over and over again, whether it's the light, the bread, the sheep, the door, the sheep. Everything is about being reconciled back to God, right? And everything that's be, about being reconciled to God is sustained through a relationship with the Son. That's all these metaphors are saying if I were to summarize them up in a nutshell. And the one that I want to... Um, two more, just quickly. Uh, John 14. John 14 and verse 1. Jesus, speaking to his disciples, says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. You know, we hear the term about abiding in Christ, right? The dwelling place for man is with God, isn't it? And, his, and God and his son Christ. The place that he's preparing for us is to be in the presence of his Father with him forever. So that where I am, listen to what he said, where I am, you may be also. Because he's at the right hand of the Father, enjoying the blessings of being in the presence of God forever. The first commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We should want to be with God if we love him, right? How do you love? We're supposed to love no, no earthly relationship more than Christ. How will you ever love somebody the way that, that you should if you don't want to be with them? Wives, husbands, children, parents. I think I probably covered everybody in the room. Some, how is it that you can love somebody but never want to be with them? You know what I'm saying? I mean, this, this kind of heart makes us not have to pray. I gotta pray. Makes us not have to read our Bibles to learn more about the God, but want to read our Bibles. I don't have to preach the gospel to somebody. I can't not preach the gospel to somebody. Because the love for God is that is what matters to his heart the most. That's why he sent his son. I can do a lot of nice things for people, but if I don't give them the opportunity for eternal life. I have probably failed them with the greatest act of love failure there is. Yeah. Now, nobody wants to hear that, but God's love is demonstrated through giving his son so that nobody would perish, John 3, 16, but they would have everlasting life. So I can be a really nice guy, never tick them, you know, never threaten to tick them off, and I'm not saying to be offensive. That's not the, you know. I hate that we have to put disclaimers on everything because we so get extreme in our thinking, but. You know, I'm not saying now that means just be a jerk. But I said in our, our fellowship a few weeks ago, if you're under the concept that speaking the gospel to somebody is ramming it down their throat, it's safe to say you never will. 
You never will. And let me put this into perspective for you. If everybody in your neighborhood was dying from plague, and somehow you landed upon the cure, do you think going to tell them I can help you out is ramming it down their throat? Anybody? If your family's sick, lying sick now, I understand that people don't always read this as being good news. I get that point. I get that some people are going to think you're a whack. I get all that. But that can't be, we do this not because of what people are going to do or not do. We do that because this is what Christ did for us and this is what we get to share with others. Amen. This is what he was about, reconciling men back to God. I mean, this is all these I am verses. Oh, uh, okay. Verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how do we know the way? You've got to love the disciples. That's who we are. Lord, I don't get this. What are you talking about? <laughs> Ever feel that way? Yeah. I love these records because they're questions we ponder, aren't they? Lord, I don't know what you're doing. I'm not sure what's going on. I am the way, Jesus said to them, and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's no way to the Father. Paul, Paul figured that out in, you know, when you read his writings. He was a very zealous follower of God. He was a very intelligent man, a very biblically trained man in the scrolls and in the ways and the customs that God prescribed. But he understood what he had in Christ. He understood the only way he could be right with God was through a relationship with his son the living, resurrected Lord, who's there to help and to sustain, who's there to strengthen us and encourage us, who's there to help us in time of sin because he was tempted in all points and overcame. Pam showed us a great illustration with Peter last week. There, how, one of the ways that Peter could have learned to make the bunny rabbit better would have been to stay there with Pam so she could have kept teaching one of the ways, which is the way that it works with the Lord too. You can learn from the book, but with, with our Lord, it's both. You learn from the book and you learn from being with the one who knows the way and knows how to overcome. Amen. You learn how to make bunnies by spending time with the one who knows how to make bunnies out of towels. <laughs> no, I mean, in my field of plumbing, that's how it works too. You've got paper, plum, paper master plumbers, guys that would grew up in a family of plumbers who know how to take a written test and get a license, but you don't want them putting your toilet in because they've never worked with a plumber to see how it's done. That's apprenticeship. It's another term, but it's apprenticeship. Apprent and we're apprentices of Christ. We get to read the code book. And I'm using plumbing analogies, oh my God. We get to read the code book to learn how it's supposed to be done, and then we get to learn how to perform it. Because it has to not just stay here. It has to stay, go from here, with him, and out. We will never know what Paul knew if we don't experience what Paul experienced. We will never understand the epistles just from reading them alone. We will understand them when we take a step of faith and we walk as followers of Christ in his steps. Then we will experience what Paul experienced and we will gnosko, know by experience the very things that he's saying. If we play it, the Christian life, it's impossible to play safe, guys. If you play it safe, then all you need is your cleverness, your strength, your wisdom. Ouch. But that's true. That's true. And finally, if it doesn't, in John 15, if it doesn't get much clearer than this, Jesus uses in verse 1 of John 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Now, we've heard this analogy before, but if God's at work in your life to prune things away from you, that's a good thing. Because maybe you've begun to bear fruit, but maybe you're there to bear, maybe you've got to bear more fruit. And if you're going to bear more fruit, he's going to prune you. He's got to clean you. You know what I'm saying? Anybody want to be a fruitful vine in Christ? Then you're yielding yourself to the master to be pruned. You're yielding yourself to the master vine dresser, God our Father, who will prune things and trim things in your life. The thing about God's partnership in this thing, though, is you got to let it go. you got to yield the branch to be pruned, because God doesn't necessarily come in and just rip it away from you. you got to yield to him and allow him to prune you. 
He goes, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you except you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. That doesn't mean I can't run a household. That doesn't mean I can't run a job. That doesn't mean I can't go to the store. That doesn't mean I can't r drive a car. That does mean I cannot live a Christian life without him. That's what that means. I cannot live a Christian life without Christ. It's crazy. <laughs> Look at the gift that God has given us in his son. Because, you know, the things that Victor shared from us from Deuteronomy a few weeks, I'm sure that some of those guys well intended to carry out those instructions, but they failed. And if we think we can carry out the things that, that we hear that God instructs us to do just by determination alone, we too will fail. We need the strength that comes from God alone. And that, it, that comes down to when anybody who's ever recovered from bad things in their life realize it really means you've got to surrender and agree you're weak. Oh, does the pride come... Everything in you that, that's about you is now getting agitated. But the reality is you ain't all that and I ain't all that. He's all that. He's all that. And that's why, that's why Paul, think about this verse. This is what we've been talking about. Paul knew this experientially, all the things that we looked at this morning when he says this. Therefore, if you, if you have been raised up with Christ, you have to, in order to be raised up with Christ, you have to reckon yourself dead. There's no resurrection without a death. So if you reckon yourself dead and Christ has raised you up, keep seeking the things where? This is where it gets us most of the time. If we keep seeking the things here and not there, we won't get this. This will be nice sounding verses, but it won't have our hearts. I want to be like Paul. I want to know what that means because I live it. Not just say, that's a great verse. It's a nice teaching. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died. You have died. And your life is hidden where? In Christ and God. So that when people see you and I, they see Christ. They don't see Charlie. They don't see Tim, Anthony. They don't see Dan. They see Christ. And as Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Let it be said of us that he who has seen us has seen our Lord. Amen? When Christ, who is our life. That's what we just read. That he's everything. He's the bread. He's the way. He's the resurrection. He's to, in order to do anything, we have to abide in. He is everything. Paul describes in Colossians that the riches of the glory of God, the riches is Christ in us. All the wisdom and all the knowledge of God is found, the treasure is found in Christ. Why did Paul know this? He didn't know this just because he studied the scriptures. He knew this because he knew the Son of God. He knew he wasn't alone when he had to stand against the things that he had to stand against. And neither will you or I. It's not about us. It's about he who is faithful. He will not leave us. God will not leave us nor forsake us. And he has done this through the person of his Son. Gosh, what we have available to us. People, this world is dark. It is not good enough for the church to keep talking about how dark the world is and pull up our stakes and retreat into We don't say come, we go. Jesus' command wasn't, you know, to build up and have him come. It's to go. And that looks different from each one of us. Some of us find our circles of life in different spheres of influence, right? Nobody, um, I think I'm the only plumber in the room. But some of you guys have different vocations, right? And where you are, you're sent. And hopefully as we look over the next few weeks, you will understand that that's not a burden. That's a, that's a privilege of unspeakable grace and mercy. That somebody like me, who has screwed up his life more times than I can count, could actually, because of what Christ did for me, speak on behalf of a holy God, that's astounding. 
So it's not about our failures, it's about his greatness. Because that's why we need a savior, because we mess it up. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> Amen? So Father, please help us this day to be, hear what you have to say, Lord, and help it make a living translation. Lord, speak to our lives this day. Show us, Lord. And yes, some things we walk through, we go through, there's some fear, God, but you're there with us. And Lord, we're not alone because your son is with us also. I thank you for the comfort that brings and the strength that you've given to us, God. Please help us to see the treasure that we have in your son. Oh Lord, for the, your glory and the honor of the name of your son in this land, let us be a people that grabs a hold of this truth, that you may be known, God, that you may be known for all that you are. In mer There's none like you in holiness. There's none like you in love. There's none like you in compassion and mercy, God. There's none like you who can save like you can, God, to take evil men and make them your own children. You are the Holy One who cannot be turn to and whose face cannot be seen but you're the father on the hill looking out for us God and I thank you for the gift of your son and his presence with us Lord thank you this day through Jesus Christ Amen